Hello, welcome to today's show. We're here to bring you thought-provoking discussions with industry experts. Please like and subscribe to make sure that you get the latest updates and also so that we're encouraged to keep creating content for you. I'm your host, Robin Leonard. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AF Digital. Today, we have a very special guest joining us, Daniel Howell. He's the CEO and founder of Gravity Lab. Gravity Lab is a New Zealand-based Salesforce consulting business. Daniel is a seasoned entrepreneur and business consultant, passionate about driving performance and empowering organizations. With his ex expertise in digital strategy, process design, and Salesforce development, Daniel has successfully guided numerous businesses towards sustainable growth. We're thrilled to have him here today to delve into some fascinating topics and gain valuable insights. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Hello, Daniel. Nice and try. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you. I can't lie, ChatGPT did help me after we both read your LinkedIn <laughs> profile together. Today's format is an AMA, so we're going to be asking Daniel a series of questions from our audience. First question that we have for Daniel is, what does a day in the life of a Salesforce consulting partner CEO look like? I think that really varies depending on the stage of the consulting partner. So obviously, once you're in an under 10 person shop, you're involved in every build, every deal, every project management, all the roadmap discussions, the follow up, the QA, as you get bit bigger so we are 30 so we're not just in New Zealand we're expanded into Australia now so we've got three people in Sydney as of this year and expanding out there based on our good reputation. So my role now is just much more of a classic CEO facilitator meeting wonderful people like Robin who we met over in Sydney meeting with other people industry leaders just making sure that we're keeping ourselves really aligned to what the market is desiring making sure we're meeting up with really important new clients old clients we've still got clients from day one, so making sure we sustain those relationships. And my biggest focus, I'm going to give you my business formula right now, it is best team wins. So we're really passionate about hiring the best people, the A players. This has made us grow slower, hire the best people, look after them really well, keep them passionate, and invest in their development, keep them on track to delivering customer outcomes. That's my main focus is to get the best team and develop them. That's really cool. And you've given me your secret formula. So watch out. <laughs> That's great. All right, let's move on to the next question. What are the key challenges organizations face when implementing Salesforce? People get stuck and they think this is a technology tool problem. And Salesforce, when you do your com comparison, it's normally the best tool. Don't get me wrong. If you're just doing marketing, or you're just doing sales, or you're just doing service, you can, you've got some choices. But if you're trying to do all three of them, or you've got a roadmap where you want to integrate with more systems or bring on more bespoke departments, you don't have too many choices. So what it means is it's less around how does a technology work. Top tip, don't custom build everything. Don't write a thousand requirements and get it to work exactly that way. But what you want to do is really focus really on what's the business goals here? What are the customer goals here? That's where the value comes through. You don't need a consulting partner necessarily as much as you need a business partner that's gonna help you go, this is what happens. So an example of that is, I think of like an accounting integration. So you do an accounting integration, we want, oh, we want Salesforce to talk to our accounting system. That bit's easy. Like we've got predefined patterns, people that can do integrations securely on scam. That bit's easy. When should the invoice send? What are the different lines? What happens if someone changed invoice lines? What happens if invoice is paid? What happens if it's not paid? What happens if it was pay marked as paid and unmarked as paid? So all of these business logic and scenarios, it's what's really, really important. You can't map them all out in one go. So what you need to do is start small and start well. So you want to figure out what's your, some people call it MVP, I call it an MLP, a minimal lovable product. It's got to be good enough that people like using it, love using it, and it's delivering real value. So we're always trying to do, we're the opposite. We're not trying to sell big deals. We're not trying to do big implementations. What's the smallest bit we can do to get you time to value, get you on the platform. You're going to get all of these amazing benefits by using out of the box features. Once you've used it for a little bit, we can build out the roadmap from there and maybe iterate on some agile or, or may have predefined phases. For example, you might do sales and service and then quickly followed by marketing, then followed by marketing personalization, then followed by this with iterative cycles in between. So the biggest challenge is people try to do too much in one go, time and time again. Sometimes people try to do things on their own. So you might get a contract BA or a contract PM. They're not necessarily in your business. They don't know Salesforce. They're quite expensive. Sometimes people sell more contractors than they do on the external providers that actually build it. Data is a real consideration. 
thinking about what's your old data, how you're gonna get that into the new system that needs to be caught out really well. But the biggest thing is making sure this is delivering on business value. So the way I think about this, our very first workshop every time we do one is go, cool, we've talked to the managers, we've talked to these people, they're on board of this idea of having sales, they get it. Why the heck do you want to use it? Ignore the technology, what are your pain points? What are your aspirations in your job, ignoring technology? And I basically go, if I can't solve some of those for a sales rep or service rep or a marketer, then they're not going to use it. Well, we're not doing this right. So we always very first, even before we start a project, we're starting about what makes sense. So keep it focused on people, focus on business outcomes, um, and then get someone who knows the tool really well to just make sure the scale as well. That's probably another, <laughs> another little rant there is we see quite a lot of people that do one phase or they go to do phase two and it's complicated because they overcomplicated phase one keep to standard as much as possible. So a little bit of a plug here was Aaron and our team was talking to some of the Sydney kind of AEs and they said they got some clients that haven't gone live in Salesforce two years later. And I'm like, WTF, what's going on here? And we, we did run some stats on ours. Of across our top 30 clients, all of them have done phase two. On average, they've done eight phases and they're still going. So we're doing three to four phases a year normally with our clients, small iterate. And each of these phases, you can come up with a really clear ROI. Less risk, do you think so? I think the biggest problem is people trying to do a big bag approach. Don't do it, it doesn't work. I really like that expression, minimum lovable product. Can you just elaborate a bit more on that? How do you define that? How do you coach customers to understand what their MLP is? MVP is like, we'll get something up and running. But getting something up and running that no one's going to use or doesn't really work. It's got to actually solve some real pain points and allude to some real aspirations of them. They've got to like using the platform. We've got a platform that out of the box is really good to use. And we want to make sure the little tailorings we do just sweeten it up. So it is that words, it is the language, it is easy to use as much as possible. So it's a little bit MVP with a, just a slightly nicer UX layer over the top of it. Or, you know. <laughs> You're quite right. What's MVP for, say, the leadership team is maybe not lovable for the actual users. The leadership team don't use it most of the time. Leadership team want data, right? Marketers want data, but data comes out of process. Mm -hmm. The process comes out of users interacting with a process. So make that as easy as possible and you solve the leadership challenges. How do you find the different spectrum of clients from clients that have never implemented Salesforce and their team don't know about Salesforce? versus a very mature client where they have people internally that really know the power of Salesforce. Yeah, there's a quite different engagement. I quite like the first one, right? They've come from something crap or, or whatever, and you just turn it on and they're just like, wow, you guys are amazing. And you're like, actually, we didn't do too, we didn't do very much. You're just actually using a proper system that works now. But there's a lot of fun working with the internal teams, right? Uh, because they can sort out the things that we do and our team can focus on interesting problems or a lot of it's like best practice advice. If you've got a senior architect involved, what they can tell you in 10 minutes is really valuable and steering those teams on the right track. We love the idea of clients. We do manage support for our clients that don't have the internal team. But I love it when we can help the team hire an internal team. They've got internal capacity so they can own these things and they come to us with the tricky stuff. They come to us with the interesting problems Problems and we can really add a lot of value. It's a really interesting balance. As you see them mature, it's like they do bring in some skills in-house and they stop needing partners to do the basic stuff, but then they get the partners to focus on really what the partners are there for, it's the expert services. Especially like how should these things all link together? We also yeah. do revenue consulting as well. So that's nice. Let's not set up users. Let's actually, what is your go-to-market strategy? How are you moving people throughout the sales cycle? Combination of sales and marketing. It's good to have that context behind the Salesforce project. Otherwise, you're just implementing Salesforce and being an order taker. People would come up with just really fluffy sales processes. And I go, how do you know what stage this is? We've all got different definitions of this. How are we going to get everybody on the same team? So we did a lot more tightening around those. Now we see a little bit less fluffiness, but what we do see is a disconnect between the sales process back to the buyer journey. So what's the buyer journey? What decisions are they making? How do you help them go through that process, make those decisions? Therefore, this is your sales process. Therefore, this is your CRM process. Therefore, this is your marketing journey, which underpins it all. So getting that tight alignment is where we can offer a lot of value. And that's tight alignment. That's where you get 10 to 20% revenue growth. It's a, it's a little things done well that makes a big difference. What are the top trends in customer experience that businesses should be aware of and prioritize? 
You look at how a customer interacts with you and how they interact with other technologies in their day to work, how they're operating with uh, the Google suite, how they're operating with the Facebook suite, how they're operating with Uber and different things. Customer expectations are high. This is nothing new, but they expect things to just work well. The ongoing thing with business is really the omni-channel experience. If they WhatsApp you, they Facebook you, they email you, they call you, they visit your website, they just see you as a brand. They don't care if it's Sally Woodham on the background, they just see the brand and expect you to know these things about them. So if you're not connecting up all that data in one place, how are you supposed to respond? They expect your marketing to change depending on how they've interacted with you on the orders. They expect a lot of different things because they're, by definition, dealing with the biggest companies in the world because they've got the biggest reach in the world every day. So you really, to keep up in the market, you need to make sure you've got this in your roadmap in the future. Of course, as generative AI, that's getting baked into everything, but I still think it's getting all your data in one place so you can utilize it. Otherwise, you don't have options in five years' time. So if you fast forward to five years' time, we don't know what the marketing trends are going to be, but we need to back systems and platforms and ways of working so we can be a market leader in that place in the future. For the marketer to be able to provide those experiences that are similar to what Uber would provide or the big brands, they need to get their data in order first. Is that a marketing project to get the data in order or is that a marketing requirement? Who, who's responsible for getting all of the back-end systems together? Digital marketers should have data capabilities in their team. They need that for segmenting, for running, for campaigns, for measuring. They, they need that capability now, but it's not their core competency. And I think that's got to sit with whoever's owning the, the CRM normally, because the CRM is your, is your hub, your order data, your transaction data, your online data. They can organize that in a better way. Maybe that's in the CRM, maybe that's in a separate data warehouse or data lake. I, don't, I personally think it's unlikely to be in your marketing team. What about you, Robert? What I do see is marketing often owns Salesforce CRM because they've just bought it with their credit card and the IT department focus on the Oracle or the SAP and the big software. But I think the IT departments need to cross skill and actually bring Salesforce into their organization if they haven't done already. I think there's a lack of trust there as well because marketers want to move at pace and they're aware of this discussion like we're behind. And IT, they deliberate and, and they, IT needs to remember that IT's customer is the marketing team. You don't need the integration to be perfect. You don't need to bring it all in. What data can you bring in now quickly to help them proxy? And little, little things like, we're, we're talking basics. I was on YouTube and I got a Spotify advert. What are they doing? I've subscribed to Spotify for three years. Why are you wasting marketing spend on me? Exactly. Like, it's very easy. This is like marketing basics to like unsubscribe, put me on a subscription list so I don't show up on your advertising list because I'm already a customer. So I think IT needs to move at pace. What are some best practices for maximizing the value of Salesforce within an organization? One way overall is having a really clear roadmap and a framework and a digital transformation plan. Why did we buy it? You look at all tech projects or all business projects. Coming back to why did we make this? What was the business case? Are we hitting those benefits? And if you do that tightly, you can't go big bang, do it all do less, have really clear measures of what time to value will be for each of those phases. But having a digital transformation, know what phase two, phase three, what roadmap, where you're going to iterate. The second one there is to really hone the platform. It's the iterative ad hoc processes that happen after it. You can go live on a project with all planned out, but it's a little refinements if you can shadow a sales user or have a really good SME or marketer or whoever you're working with and figure out what's going to really help them do their job. You're doing this. What if we had a report that proactively told you to do this? And like, oh, what if we actually just put that to a marketing journey so that happened and then it told you were the people who responded to that. People don't know what they want. So Bet my best practice, get them on the platform, get them using it, shadow them, and then get real world wins on the board. It's like the Steve Jobs approach of the customer doesn't really know what they want. You just have to give them what they need. And Salesforce is a little bit like that where it's all available. It's been designed by all of these engineers. They've spent possibly billions of dollars on R&D to get it to a point. Often it's just a matter of explaining, oh, this is what you can do with it and just fitting the current functionality to the business process. But a lot of it's just education on their side. They just need to know what's possible and then they can ask for it. And it's longer term thinking. We look at all these people that are stuck with 
the dreaded technical debt term, right? Because mm. someone said they want it a specific way, so it's all been customized, and then they can't utilize the new features as well. Our job as an implementation partner is to show them the options and the risk and benefit of each option and go, actually, don't give us money, don't customize that now, so that it'll be really easy to adopt the future features. What key roles do you see that clients adopting Salesforce successfully should have on their side? In terms of a project, you really need a strong sponsor. You do need internal project managers. We do provide our own ones. BAs, I think often, if you don't have them, I would get them from the partner rather than contracting them internally. There's a raft of reasons for that. But you need a couple of champions. There's probably the most important one. Sponsor, champions, and some internal admins. So ad internal admins understand how to make basic changes, understand data, can make reports, good things. But your champions are the people that can do your internal training. Because you can't just train them once, show them some slide decks and go two weeks time assume they're using it. People don't work that way. We make videos normally, for example, we put inline guidance or my actual test is if you need training, we haven't made a very good system. It should be in your language, click new lead, this type of product, this type of customer. It should all make sense to do the job. And Salesforce is really good at that. It's really good at building flows, workflows and inline guidance into the platform. Really clear sponsorship. Why are we doing this? What's that roadmap I need to deliver on? I need to get to that end state here. And then internal champions that love it. And then people go internally so they don't get stuck. They can talk to the person next to them. What are the key metrics that businesses should use to measure their success with Salesforce? The real measure should be your business goals. And then what are your sub measures underneath that that link up? More generic ones, conversion rates, cost or acquisition. If you're doing sales and marketing together, it should be your campaign ROI, including things like campaign influence. So cost or acquisition, how many of those actually turn into customers? What's the lifetime value of those customers? That whole process, including churn. Sales and marketing, there's a reason we have CROs that, to link those together. Campaign influencers or soft attribution is going, they didn't buy because of this Facebook ad, but lots of people were in the Facebook ad campaign before they got to the personalized website. So there's something going on there that's leading to value. There's a correlation there. As we talk about AI and modern data things, it's less binary, it's less linear, it's less defined logic. Yeah, it's really good at opening up multi ways of attributing across that. Adoption, massive. If people aren't using it, I've watched some Salesforce implementations, which we didn't do. We came and did reviews of. Spending like a million dollars a year on their internal teams, bigger organizations, and they still got spreadsheets for their KPI reporting. So got spreadsheets for tracking different things. I've seen this multiple times. That this is when IT have led it, and they've gone really integration focused and all of these bits and pieces. Marketers need to love it, otherwise they won't use it. And if they don't use it, I can tell you what you're not going to get value from. That's your biggest thing right there. If you can get everybody on the same tool and following the same process, you can then improve that process. Can you tell me more about campaign influence and tracking campaign ROI? Marketing isn't just digital marketing. We've got brand campaigns, we've got referral campaigns, we've got lots of different types of campaigns that might not lead into sales. But we need to be smart enough to go, is there some correlation between who we're targeting with these campaigns and some sort of sales results? We can't just keep investing money into things that don't result in sales. But likewise, we can't ignore our key hunches and what we know to be true, that this campaign has a big influence. It's just harder to measure. There's ways of measuring that they've been people have been involved that hasn't linked directly to ROI. I find no customers know how to use the campaign object. It's always my little golden nugget of advice. Hey, you guys using the campaign object? You should be, because it's a really great way to track ROI of all of your marketing activities. I do find a non-profit world, they use the campaign object really well. It's part of the 101 training for non-profits on how they run their campaigns. But outside of non-profit, yeah, everyone else is just like, how do I track ROI of marketing? Who knows? It's just very yeah. fluffy. It's going to change in nonprofits with nonprofit cloud coming out, particularly late in the year. And they're getting rid of campaign hierarchies and a lot more interest in segment groups. So there's some cool ways of doing that, which are much better architecturally and going to be much more powerful. So I'm very excited about that. Likewise as well, I was wondering there, it got me curious, do nonprofits just have a fundamentally more outbound focus? Because you're not selling a product. Like when you're selling, it's like, hey, Robin, what's your pain point? I can meet your pain point. It's quite an easy discussion. Yeah. The pain point of a donor, I'm thinking out loud, is really like someone else's pain, it's concern. It's, there's an indirect, so it's quite a lot more outbound. Outbound requires lists. You've got to have a list of 10,000 people to do marketing to, rather than inbound and hope they'll come my way.
It is an interesting difference. It is uh, predominantly fundraising focused and they need lists of people. What advice do you have for businesses looking to start their Salesforce journey? We predominantly implement Salesforce, so I, but I'm not here to say Salesforce is your only option. You are really gonna know why you've chosen it as an option. And most people do choose it as an option uh, because it's the best. This is why I don't work for Salesforce, so I, don't, I can say what I like. But largely that comes back to that roadmap. So what are you trying to achieve in three years time? How are you gonna get there? Not today's problem. How are you gonna get to that state that your business is? That's what business is. What's your strategy to get to a three, five year goal? What tooling do you need to get there? So be really clear about where you're trying to get to. And then MLP, minimal lovable product, less is more. Just less is more at the beginning. You, you will need an implementation partner. Try and get someone who's not too IT, someone who understands the business process, and people with integrity that are happy to have chats and guide you through that roadmap, offer value, rather than just trying to sell you something. Yeah, it's really important that you get some guidance because you can get excited about things or people often get the, that's really exciting, this generative AI or this AI decision splits. It's, oh yeah, I want all of that. But actually there can be some really pragmatic things. So we've had clients come to us and go, oh, we want to fix all our analytics and reporting and stuff like this. And we go, well, how are you going to use that? How is that reporting going to lead into your team taking different actions next week? Because if it doesn't, a change happens, it's just noise. It's just ego metrics or noise or something like that. So is how do you run your sales meetings? How, what's your sales manager? Oh, we don't really have sales managers. And we don't, and it's like, okay, you don't have a technology problem. So it's been really clear about what problem you're trying to solve there. But to come back to the question, really clear phasing, knowing what the end state's going to look like. I'm interested in your answer on that one as well, Robin. <laughs> I'm very lined actually, Daniel. I'm all about starting small. And I see a lot of clients that they come into it and they're like, I need something that has the ability to AI decision split. And I want the best AB testing tool, all of these features. But when it comes to using it, they struggle to send an email campaign out and just to get the content together to do that. And that crawl walk run approach is the only real way to adopt Salesforce. Anything yeah. else, and you're just shooting yourself in the foot and you're over hyping the expectation. It's really hard to think through all the implications and make really good decisions when you're trying to do too much. That's um, right. Everything that you set up as a business, you need to write it down, test it, have the content to support it, and then maintain it in production. A lot of people think, oh, I'll set up a journey, set and forget, I'll walk away. It's like buying a boat. There's the cost of the boat, but every year you've got to maintain that boat and make sure it's working and seaworthy. It's the same thing with any automation that you set up in any system. You've got to think about the maintenance and who's going to be the product owner of it and will it evolve? Does it need to go through iterations as an automation on its own? So even something as simple like a welcome journey, the 101 thing to set up in Marketing Cloud, you need a product owner for the welcome journey experience. So someone needs to be responsible for making sure it's awesome and checking it every year, checking the results to make sure, oh, could it be optimized? Could we do a better job with this? That's really underplayed. Where you start with crawl walk runners, if you try to set up a hundred automations and don't have that ownership structure and the plan to maintain and iterate, then you're going to set up a lot of technical debt that you'll be too afraid to change. So it actually constrains the agility of the business. 100%. If your CRM and your marketing tool are the hub, your processes should be changing. Therefore, your tooling should be changing because your tooling delivers the processes. If you don't change your internal processes or don't change how you engage with your customers every year, you're dying probably, or you will be. So you should be changing things every year. We want to talk about marketing cloud personalization and one of the reasons we're doing this interview is actually to make a special announcement that Gravity Lab and AF Digital are forming a strategic alliance to provide marketing cloud personalization expertise into the New Zealand market. We're very aligned. We both have good reputations for delivery and we've, we're aligned on that. Let's not try and go after fancy things. Let's do things well. If we do things consistently well, we do what's right. Clients keep coming back and we both experience that as a business. We have very strong core CRM, and we have some very good marketing cloud people. Marketing cloud personalization is new to the New Zealand market. And just with integrity, we understand it. We could maintain it. We could do some things, but AF Digital have the track record of doing that record. We've got some things that they can't do. So to give the best outcome to our clients, let's get people who have real world experience. Because that's why you come to someone like us, someone who's done it multiple times and can just guide you to the best outcome. So I'm really thrilled. 
always been a fan, Robin, but really thrilled that we can just offer the best value to our clients. Thank you, Dan. And we've got a long history of working together. We've partnered on many clients before where we've actually sought Daniel's advice on our clients, given his depth of knowledge, especially in the nonprofit industry. This is really a continuation, but a deepening of an existing partnership. And we're really excited. We've taken the same approach as consulting business to not try to be all things to everyone. So really honing in on our specialization. I think this is an area that we just have very complementary services and skills that I think together, if our businesses team up, we can really help our clients go a long way. Yeah, just do what's right by the client. It doesn't matter who does it. I'm more passionate about people getting great outcomes out of the platform rather than working with us. We'll be fine. We have enough referrals coming our way, so I'm never worried about that side. But this is what people need, so it's great. What is Marketing Cloud Personalization, aka Interaction Studio? It's a way of hyper personal. I want to talk to the business level more than the tool level, but it's a way of hyper personalized hyper personalizing using tracking a lot of event-based data from different things so this could be time spent on sites and actions they've taken looking at browser history other offline sources as well putting that all in place to make it usable so there's really two really cool components and this kind of speaks to my background of like business five years macro level to micro what do we want this person to do and i love that it does both so you can, at the macro level, you could get insights around using all of these different bits of data from different really granular data. And then you can use that data to create triggers. So like behavioral and product triggers. These little tweaks of putting the right content at the right time and tweaking your emails and your websites and your apps around this. On average, people are increasing conversion by like 50% to get through to like marketing conversion. And at a lower cost, because you're hyper-targeting. So I, that gets me really excited. We used to be in the age of information. I think we're in the attention age. Whoever can hold people's attention as long as possible, sustain attention, wins. We've got data already. Now this is how do we use that data to sustain attention? And that's by talking to them in ways that are gonna keep their attention across multiple channels. That's a great way of explaining it. Everyone's acutely aware of this kind of attention disorder that society has with TikTok videos. I like to think about it from a one-to-one -one perspective. So if yeah. you and I were to catch up and it was the first time I'm meeting you, our conversation is going to be quite different to if I have known you for yeah. years and I know about your business and your family, I'm going to have a very different conversation with you. And I'm going to a lot more easily get your attention and trust because I'm going to be speaking to you as a human rather than being like, hey, Daniel, I'm Robin. I, I work at AF Digital and just giving you the blank message of our because you're like, bro, I, I know you already. Like, <laughs> we've been working together for a while. How do you not remember who I am? It's very simple. Tying up that data that we've got on that customer and giving them a real-time experience that takes that data and uses it to give them something relevant is it's actually more empathetic. Brands, for so long, they've had their media budgets and they have to spend on ads and they have to touch a customer 15 times before they'll buy. But it's just blunt force touching. What if I could touch them three times very effectively and really hyper target. Daniel's about to have a child and why don't I target him with something that's very specific to his experience in life? You've got one shot at some of these things. Marketing kind of gets lazy thinking I can just keep influencing and they'll come. If they've heard of me, they'll come to me. That's a bit weak. Make yourself really useful and they'll come to you. Something you mentioned actually is the conversion and a lot of people get caught up in the buzz of Salesforce, but personalization by nature is a CRO tool. You know, it's really there for the purpose of conversion. It started its life as a website personalization engine. And there's many of those out there where marketing cloud personalization is a bit different is it also takes in your first party CRM data. So a lot of these personalization engines, you throw them on the website and they can do pop-ups and personalization of content based on say where you're browsing from. But the difference with Marketing Cloud is that you've also got access to your CRM and your Marketing Cloud data. So you can start to go, oh, okay, this person I actually know that he's got a complaint with me. He also spends a huge amount of money with me every year. And he really likes this one product that we've got. How am I gonna personalize his experience on the website that's a bit different based on that first party data? It's a lot richer than if you're just using a personalization engine. And I think that's the key difference a lot of people 
people don't know yeah. about personalization that uses that data. So it's really holistic. And it's not just your web, it's mobile app, it's your marketing emails, it's a bit of everything. It was just less guesswork, right? I've got what their cases were, all their product history. You know? Going back to the IT data conversation, for marketing to be able to personalize at scale and trust it's working, the data needs to be correct. If there's any risk that the data is incorrect, it means the marketer is uncertain and uneasy about doing any kind of mass automation. It's such a difficult thing to achieve, but it's really the dream of the future. And for companies to stay relevant, they have to do this personalization. As you said, you've got these companies like Uber that are delivering this at scale globally. And if you don't deliver a consistent experience, you may just not be around. I mean, once your system start linking up, your salespeople should know what service tickets are in there. And the salespeople should look at order history. We're just making this happen in an automated way. But once you've connected in your ERP or your purchase data, then these options become available. Marketing cloud core becomes much more powerful when you're doing these personalization. You've got commerce as well. So we've done this for one of our big clients, Panasonic, that they've, now that ERP data was all in there, then it made sense to use that data to do an online storefront for dealer portals so they could log in and self-serve. Saves a lot of time, but also just a much better customer experience. So once you start linking up your data, you can start utilizing it in many ways. And this is just one example, a particularly good one though. What is the value of personalization? Why is it important? Who doesn't want to increase their conversion rates by 50%? Let's be honest, it might be 20%, it might be 70%, it's, it's going to be something. That's businesses live on their revenue and they live on the number of customers they, they get through the door and the, the repeat business of customers, so it's super important. I think the other part of this is to look into the future of where is tech going. If you look at some futurists, like websites, we still think of navigation structures and I log in, I need to find what I want. That won't be there in five years' time. They will be fully personalized experiences that will, you think of chat to be figuring out what you want, but this, th these personalized websites will just start changing depending on how you've been there in really massive ways. That's gonna be the standard of the internet. So you, you need to line yourself up so you've got the data and the structures and the tools so you can do that. Otherwise you're gonna be so far behind. Having a WhatsApp number is not that impressive now. That's what you need to get to. If you're not building these foundations now, your business is gonna get overtaken. It is really important. There's a lot of awareness around customer data. Do I trust the brand to use it appropriately? Part of this is just the safe use of that data rather than having systems that aren't really in sync and maybe uploads and downloads of data internally and sending data to your marketing agencies. These kind of things aren't really the way we should be moving forward and there's a massive data breach risk. But with an automated system that does the personalization at scale in a secure way with your data securely, that really mitigates so much potential reputation damage. What we're finding with rapidly growing sales companies, particularly high tech ones that are expanding off overseas, selling all those products, you hit an inflection point where adding more headcount doesn't get more effective. What's worked from your past isn't going to work for your next step change growth. So there's a couple of things there. One is your processes need to change, your sales approach needs to change, but also you don't know who your new customers are because you've never worked with them, so you don't have data on them. So it's the same thing. You need to get that foundation where adding more headcount isn't going to change. You need to go back and get your structures in place. And personalization is just another way of doing that. There's a lot of companies that will say, you'll never replace Mabel on the front desk. Our customers love her. They love speaking with her and it's because Mabel gets to know the customers and she's lovely but she's offering a personalized experience it's possible I don't want to sound evil but it's possible to fool a human brain to make them feel like a brand is empathetic for them or is very personal if they show that personalized experience you can have a chat bot that even if it doesn't even if it's just very programmed and mechanical the end user can have an emotional response as a result of how they interact and I think personalization it removes the dependency on Mabel because you don't have to have those great customer service people. You can't always rely on them to know or really care about the customer also. But with personalization, it just provides the Mabel experience at, at scale and customers love it. They love it. So why change? They're not asking for Mabel back after they've had a great online experience. And I, I think of, like I said, very people focused. I think of Mabel. When I come into these organizations and I look at how they're running, they go, you've got your A players over there and you keep limiting them. Like you take your A marketers that can't do this and they know it's the future. Guess who's 
going to start leaving your team and guess which ones can find jobs quicker your a players so purely the retention strategy as well you need to be able to enable them to do their best jobs and if mabel's just doing repeat orders and manually typing things in or dealing with the same things all the time mabel's gonna leave yeah for if mabel, mabel can't find another job then i i am optimistic i do feel like the future for mabel is actually getting a job as a product SME in the product team for the customer experience as the customer experience being the product so she's the, the SME or the champion internally that's hey guys we've got to do it how I've done it for years except she's training the system on how to be yeah, yeah. like Mabel and then once the system's running she's checking in and she's hey Robin you've been doing a bunch of orders just checking how that's going love it oh it's missed one thing I'll sort that out for you exceptions things that humans are doing building kind of that connection yeah. rapport and that ideation which is really good the humans are always going to be better at that yeah so mabel's um, way more impactful with her mabelness yeah. and, and mabel's happier and our customers are happier and our bottom line is happier you know yeah that's right they speak to mabel when they need to speak to mabel and only when they need to speak to mabel <laughs> anyway enough about mabel <laughs> uh, what is the future of personalization it's the same, but just across more channels. Things are going to change more. Email content is not just going to be section blocks, but it's going to dynamically change a lot more, like what personalization does. But across multiple different platforms, it's just going to be built into more platforms. I think there'll be really smart routing as well, or people depending on which channel you come through. You can take that one message and instantly work out across a different channel, because we speak in different ways on different channels, including voice and, and things like this. So it's it started on websites, moved into emails, moves into apps. It's going to just keep going across multiple different things you just don't need to know and probably linkedin as well yeah, yeah. be linked into the search engines and things like that so it's instant results in the search of on other people's systems not just your own so would you say every single touch point that a customer touches a brand would be personalized to them I think everything on the digital sphere, including not on your own platform, which is the key difference. But right now, it's what we send them, but I think it will be built into other people's tools as well. It is interesting to think that everything will be personalized, which means that almost nothing exists. There should be a, the default website that you see if, if it's fully anonymous as a user. But outside of that, every website experience, every mobile, every search, every social experience will be very personalized to me. My experience will be unique. Um, yeah, as well though, like surely going future, why are we on different websites and different social platforms? Surely those will merge into one one place. One stream of consciousness. It's a very human logical thing to go, I'm on this page or website, or on this website, or on this platform, yeah. but I'll we'll start merging all together, I think, at some point. What role does customer data play in personalization? You can't do anything without that data. But I think probably what's interesting is you've got your known data. So what they've ordered, their case history, demographics maybe, what company they're from, location. We've got all their human unknown data, all the things that humans can't do. So you've got time on website, but you've also got time looking at that image and you've got time with certain events and you've clicked here and you've done this and you've opened this email and done different things. You've been on this page and that. This might be um, to the side, but I always remember, I don't know, it was maybe six, seven years ago where Facebook got down for privacy and they brought out, you can download all the information Facebook has, it made it public. And they gave you like the 60 page download and everybody was like, oh, look how much information, this is terrible. And I went, they've lied to you. This is utter BS. They have thousands of pages of data. They know how long you've clicked, viewed things. They know how we've reacted to certain things before you've reacted by the way that you scroll past things and the way you comment, the things you start typing. But they store data on all of those events. There's a lot of unknown data as well that you just need the tools to collect. And then you need the AI to process. It's really great that you called out that known versus unknown. I've heard it likened to an iceberg of data. You see the known data at the top, but there's all of this other data around their behaviors. And the only reason why it's unknown is because maybe we haven't connected their device ID that they're browsing on to the customer record that we've got at the top of the iceberg. And once we connect that, then we can see all of that unknown data. You think about the device ID and you have to match that. So you've got You've got your laptop device ID, you've got your phone device ID, and once that's been mapped to the customer record, you can track both those devices. But another device ID you have is your face. So if I'm in public and there's cameras and I've given hopefully approval for them to use that, they can actually match my unique 
face as a device ID to my personality so they can then, I know it sounds scary, but it's really just about matching the different identities. You've got customer data, but it's actually other customer data. If Robin and I have similar buying habits, so his buying habits can inform my recommendations. That's really important because your future step change growth isn't coming from your customers or even your lookalike customers. How do you get that data on markets you haven't broken into yet so you can do personalization and marketing and reach outs? Where do you sit with the ethics of using data like this? I've normalized, so I worry sometimes. I always, oh, this is very scary. I don't like this. I don't like manipulation. I, I really hold integrity. It's a core value. But if it can be useful, when Google helps me type my email subjects, it helps me complete my sentences. It's, quite, it's useful. Is it creepy? Maybe. ChatGTP is useful. So as long as marketing is a tool that's being used to add value, it's really useful. There are general concepts of marketing that can be manipulative that I don't like. Trying to convince someone to buy something they don't want and people go, they've got agency to make their own decisions. But there's quite a lot of psychological bias. People are, we're well, not that rational. The way I always think about this segue again is people buy on emotions and justify with logic. We think we bought that car because of the safety rating, because of reviews actually i just wanted that red car at the end of the day we are very emotional so i think we're more susceptible to this we are at a level now where they can influence emotions a lot more and i do think it's a bit scary i tend to agree i don't think there's any way around it except that just being aware of the things that we do and what the scalable impact could be if you're helping a client sell something that's really damaging the environment and using this technology then that makes me stop and check and we, we've got clients we wouldn't work with we've got clients yeah. i won't name, name the industries but there's a bunch of industries i wouldn't work with. i think they're net negative on the world they're not good for society and we're not yeah. desperate so we're not going to work with them and if we are i'd rather not do business with them so i don't want to perpetuate those messages Mm. But uh, technology is another technology play. Our cars bad for the world, but they're bad for the environment. Mm. I've got a car. I've got a I've got an efficient car, but cars mm. aren't inherently bad. They are dangerous, but the benefit can outweigh in different areas. So you just need mm. to make sure we're doing good with this. So exactly. the technology is already here. You've got a choice to use good for it. Yes, mm. this will be used by hackers and organized crime and all sorts of things with nefarious purposes or massive industries that I'm not a fan of, but that doesn't mean we can't use it. It's just about being responsible with the use of it. And with this power comes a great responsibility, especially in the management of that data security. So actually that's a great segue. This is our final question. What are some risks or concerns with personalization? Um, there are risks that if our data, we're cap capturing a lot of data, so we need to use tools that are really secure, such as our schools. There's risks that our data is not accurate and we do the wrong thing. You have to make some assumptions about the accuracy of your data to do business. Otherwise, I can't talk to any customer ever. So I don't think that's such a big concern. But there was a really interesting case many years ago when they first started doing marketing automation where a woman had displayed all the buying behaviors of being pregnant and yeah, they yeah. started marketing. You would have heard about that one. Yeah. yeah, it's a very famous case. But I think that's the balance. They didn't stop doing what they were doing. It wasn't like, let's stop doing that smart segmentation. It was more about, let's be less creepy with it. So it's just a, it's a bit of a balance to make it feel like, oh, we are being empathetic we are personalizing to you, but we're not being overly creepy and assuming things about you. I, I really like your idea of the one-to-one -one communication. There's, there's non-creepy ways of doing them. Exactly. Thinking how a human will interact is a really good gauge. Linking this back with CRM data and the difference of this tool is watching Google, Facebook market to me after I've made a decision. I bought a new washing machine. And they still think I need a new washing machine mm. because they don't know I bought one two weeks ago. That's right. You link yeah. in the CRM, you're, you're saving a bunch of marketing spend and you're getting a much better customer experience yeah. because they, they go down these rabbit holes. So this is a YouTube problem of personalization of thinking you want this. You've watched this video, therefore this is the content you want. And so no, I just yeah. wanted that a little bit. It just creates a, a more empathetic experience and you can automate the experience at scales if you do it with that intention that you're not spamming people with the wrong message or not trying to convince people to buy something that they don't really want to buy it's actually a lot better experience for your customers that's the good of it is when you use it for that intention i think we're out of time but thank you so much daniel really appreciate you coming on the show today and really great insights our audience is going to be stoked please like and subscribe we're really looking to grow the channel bring more guests on like daniel and his expertise awesome thanks all and thank you robin Thank you.